Welcome to the Reading the Bible Daily with Dave podcast. This podcast is devoted to helping increase your daily exposure to God's Word with a short scripture reading and brief commentary on key ideas, themes, and theology in each chapter. Now please join your host, Dave Jenkins, for today's episode. All right, everybody, welcome back to the Reading the Bible Daily with Dave podcast. My name is Dave, and I'm the host for this show. And today is January 21st, and today we're going to read from Genesis chapter 21. As a reminder, every day I very briefly uh, explain the chapter, and then I offer, uh, cover the themes and the theology very briefly. My goal in this show is to get you into God's Word for about 5 to 20 minutes every day. And yes, sometimes we go over. Uh, We go 30 minutes. But let's get into our reading from God's Word today. Genesis 21. It says, The Lord visited Sarah as he had said, and the Lord did to Sarah as he had promised. And Sarah conceived and bore Abraham a son in his old age at the time of which God had spoken to him. Abraham called the name of his son who was born to him, whom Sarah bore him, Isaac. And Abraham circumcised his son when he was eight days old, as God had commanded him. Abraham was a hundred years old when his son Isaac was born to him. And Sarah said, God has made laughter for me. Everyone who hears will laugh over me. And she said, Who would have said to Abraham that Sarah would nurse children? And yet I have borne him a son in his old age. And the child grew and was weaned. And Abraham made a great feast on that day that Isaac was weaned. But Sarah's son saw the son of Hagar, the Egyptian, whom she had borne to Abraham laughing. And so she said to Abraham, Cast out the slave woman with her son, for the son of this slave woman shall not be heir with my son Isaac. And the thing was very displeasing to Abraham on account of his son. But God said to Abraham, Be not displeased because of the boy and because of your slave woman. Whatever Sarah says to you, do as she tells you. For through through Isaac shall your offspring be named. And I will make a, a nation of the son of the slave one also, because he is your offspring. And so Abraham rose early in the morning and took bread and a skin of water and gave it to Hagar, putting it on her shoulder along with the child, and sent her away. And she departed and wandered in the wilderness of Beersheba. And when the water in the skin was gone, she put the child under one of the bushes. And then she went and sat down opposite him a good way off, about the distance of a bow shot. For she said, Let me not look on the death of the child. And as she sat opposite him, she lifted up her voice and wept. And God heard the voice of the boy, and the angel of God called to Hagar from heaven and said to her, What troubles you, Hagar? Fear not, for God has heard the voice of the boy where he is. Up! Lift up the boy and hold him fast with your hand, for I will make him into a great nation. And God opened her eyes, and she saw a well of water. And she went and filled the skin with water and gave the boy a drink. And God was with the boy, and he grew up. He lived in the wilderness and became an expert with the bow. He lived in the wilderness of Paran, and his mother took a wife for him from the land of Egypt. At that time, Abimelech and Peshkel, the commander of his army, said to Abraham, God is with you in all that you do. Now, therefore, swear to me here by God that you will not deal falsely with me or my descendants or with my posterity, but I I have dealt kindly with you, so you will deal with me with the land where you have sojourned. And Abraham said, I swear. And Abraham reproved Abimelech about a well of water that Abimelech's servants had seized. Abimelech said, I do not know who has done this thing. You did not tell me, and I have not heard of it until this day. And so Abraham took sheep and oxen and gave them to Abimelech, and the two men made a covenant. Abraham set seven ewe lambs of the flock apart, and Abimelech said to Abraham, What is the meaning of these seven ewe lambs that you have set apart? He said, These seven ewe lambs you will take from my hand, that this may be a witness for me that I dug this well. Therefore that place was called Beersheba, because there both of them swore an oath. And so they made a covenant at Beersheba. And then Abimelech and Peshkel, the commander of the army, rose up and returned to the land of the Philistines. Abraham planted a tamarisk tree in Beersheba, and there called on the name of the Lord, the everlasting God. And Abraham sojourned many days in the land of the Philistines. 
So, um, verses 21, 1 through 21, the birth of Isaac. Now, in fulfillment of God's promise, Sarah bears Abraham a son who is named Isaac. And in due course, Isaac is confirmed as Abraham's heir when God instructs Abraham to send Hagar and Ishmael away. And while Isaac takes priority over Ishmael, God does not abandon Hagar and her son. As he had promised, takes us back to Genesis seventeen sixteen, Genesis seventeen nineteen, and Genesis seventeen twenty one. Verse two, at that time of which God had spoken to him, takes us back to Genesis eighteen ten and Genesis eighteen fourteen. Genesis twenty one three, Isaac. The name was announced by God to Abraham in Genesis seventeen nineteen. Verse four. Isaac is circumcised by Abraham in fulfillment of God's instructions in Genesis seventeen twelve. Now, verses 5 through 6, they underline the unexpected nature of Isaac's birth. Abraham and Sarah are both very old. Verse 8, on the day that Isaac was weaned. Isaac was probably, most likely, two or three years old, although we're not told in this passage how old he is exactly. Verse 9, the Hebrew verb translated laughing is an ambiguous, and it, and it may be interpreted as denoting either mocking or playing. The verbal form used here possibly favors mocking. Galatians 4.29 follows this interpretation. Ishmael was probably making fun of Isaac's role as Abraham's son. Uh, verse 10, Ishmael is Abraham's son, and Sarah does not want him to be an eligible heir alongside Isaac. And Paul uses Sarah's words in his allegory of the two covenants in Galatians 4.30, verses 11 through 13. And while Abraham is reluctant to send Ishmael away, God reassures him that this is really for the best, verse 12. And through Isaac shall your offspring be named. So even though Ishmael is older than Isaac, God confirms that Isaac will take priority over Ishmael according to Genesis seventeen nineteen. And the importance of this will be picked up in Romans 9, 7 and Hebrews eleven eighteen, verse 14. Putting it on her shoulders along with the child. And while these words might suggest that Ishmael was placed on Hagar's shoulder, this is hardly likely since Ishmael is about 16 years old at this time. The last thing that Abraham did was to give Ishmael to Hagar, probably after putting it in the, br the bread and the water on Hagar's shoulder. The Hebrew term for child may denote an older teenager. It was used of Joseph in Genesis thirty-seven thirty. The Wilderness of Beersheba Water was difficult to find in this region. Man-made wells appear to have been the main source of water. Verses 15 through 16. God's intervention saves Hagar and confirms to her that her son will become a great nation in verse 18, echoing the promise given to Abraham in verse 13. God heard the voice of the boy in verse 17. And although this passage avoids the use of the personal name, Ishmael means God hears. And although it was Ishmael's misbehavior that led to the expulsion from Abraham's household, God reaffirms his promise in Genesis 21:18, I will make him into a great nation. Verse 21, wilderness of Paran is the central region in the northern Sinai. Verses 22 through 34, Abimelech makes a treaty with Abraham, and acknowledging Abraham's power, Abimelech established with him a treaty intended to protect both parties. Verses 22 through 23. This takes us back to verse 2 of chapter 20. God is with you in all that you do. Abimelech attributes Abraham's success to God. Uh, verses 25 through 30. And before sealing the treaty, Abraham raises a contentious issue of ownership. The covenant or treaty was designed to prevent conflict between the two parties, and the gift of seven ewe lambs to Abimelech confirms Abraham's ownership of the well. Verse 31. Abraham's gift to Abimelech, the name Beersheba, it probably means well of seven. However, given that the Hebrew word for seven and oath are similar, it could mean the well of oath. Perhaps the name was chosen because it embraced both concepts. Now, given uh, Abraham's semi-nomadic lifestyle and the need for him to dig at a well, no sediment probably existed at this location at a time. At this time, and when a permanent settlement was later established in this area, the name of the well was given to it in Genesis 26:33. The town of Beersheba, located in the northern Negev, became famous as marking the southern boundary of Israel, as we see in Judges 21 and 1 Samuel 3.20.
Verse 32, the land of the Philistines. Now, the use of the term Philistines is generally taken to be anachronistic. And since the name is normally associated with non-Canaanites from the Aegean region who inhabited the southwest Canaan, at about 1180 BC, onward nearly a thousand years after Abraham's time. In 1 Samuel, the Philistines are portrayed as the main opponents of Israel. Verse 33, everlasting God is the Hebrew word El Oliam. In Hebrew, El is a common Semitic term for God, followed by or attributed to everlasting Olam. Now, there have been several points in our study of Genesis where we've seen a major advancement or a new stage in the Lord's work of redemption. We saw in Genesis 8 through 9, 17, God's covenant with Noah. And we've seen uh, the covenant that God made with Abraham in Genesis 15 and Genesis 17. These are two instances when the divine purposes for humanity moved forward in monumentally historic ways. Now, as we look at Genesis, uh, Genesis 21, we see how Moses wants us to understand Isaac's birth in a similar manner. His use of the Hebrew word pakad in verse 1 helps indicate this. In context, this word translates visited. It has the sense of a destiny-altering meeting. And once the Lord visited Sarah, her life was never the same. No longer would she be the childless wife of his servant Abraham. Instead, she would be the honored, she'd be honored as the mother of God's people, the matriarch of Israel. And yet this visitation also herods salvation, which is no surprise since there could be no inheritance, no blessed future for the patriarch's offspring if Sarah had birthed no children. Pagod is used in Genesis 50, 24, where Joseph predicts Yahweh's redemption of his people from Egypt. And like that momentous event, Isaac's birth represents the mighty hand of God to save his chosen ones. All that happens in Genesis 21, 1 through 5 is clearly the result of the Creator's sovereign will. The repetition of the Lord's spoken promise three times in verses 1 through 2 is a literary advice, accentuating God's absolute control of the situation. Moses' note in verse 5 that Abraham was 100 years old when Isaac was born is not an incidental detail. It reminds us that there was no way this tired elderly couple would have had a son without the miraculous touch of the Lord. And as we saw in Genesis 15 and 17, God's sovereign oath to ensure the covenant uh, is kept does not deny Abraham's responsibility. The patriarch obeys Yahweh, naming the promised son Isaac and circumcising him on the eighth day. In, in bringing life from Sarah's lifeless womb and in making our dead souls alive in regeneration, the Lord does for his people what they cannot do for themselves. But all those whom he has redeemed show that they have life, eternal life, by their good works. Now, God's sovereign and even powerful work of salvation, it frees us to obey the Lord with joy. We do not have to suffer under the burden of having our own efforts measure up, for we obey in gratitude because Christ's faithfulness has satisfied the Lord's covenant. Our responsibility is real and obligatory and is yet the most freeing submission that we have. Are you viewing obedience today as a burden? Well, ask the Holy Spirit to make you one who yearns to serve the Lord with joy. You know, everybody smiles when they peer into the bassinet holding a little baby. Even the saddest person may have his spirit lifted when he sees an infant laughing and even playing. And wherever we go, the face of a small child often brings happiness uh, to even the most uh, hardened person. Fewer events are more celebrated with as much joy as the birth of a baby. Long before the child arrives, the prospective parents, they're going to spend hours picking out the proper name, preparing a nursery for their infant. Parties are thrown where the mother-to-be is showered with gifts for the child. Anticipation, in fact, is so high that friends and family are willing to spend hours in the hospital just waiting to be among the first to see the child. And considering how this excitement is even greater for couples who have, have not conceived after years of trying to have a child, it helps us to appreciate the joy that Abraham and Sarah felt when Isaac was born. And in this chapter, Sarah announces excitedly that God has made laughter for her. And as we've already talked about, Isaac is the same Hebrew word for laughter and is the name the Lord commanded Abraham and Sarah to give to their child back in Genesis seventeen nineteen. 
In fact, Sarah laughed in disbelief that she could bear a son in Genesis 18:12, and now she can laugh at her doubt. The Lord does indeed get the last laugh, we must say. But Sarah is not only laughing at her previous behavior, she's also jubilant at the birth of her own child. The whole f- affair is truly hilarious. As she says, who would think that she could bear Abraham a son in her old age in verse 7 of, of Genesis 21? Only the Lord could see such a miracle. And Isaac is rightly seen as a type or a picture of Christ. For Mary, just like Sarah conceived only by the special touch of God in, in Matthew 1, 18 through 25. In fact, just as Isaac's name reveals a special joy at his birth, so di- too did the appearance of the Savior cause the angels to bring good tidings and glad joy of great joy in the Lord, as Luke 2, 8 through 20 says. Ambrose of Milan, the bishop who dramatically influenced Augustine, wrote, Now everybody knows that he, Jesus, is the joy of all who checked the dread of his fearsome death, who took away its terror and became for all people the forgiveness of their sins. Matthew Henry comments, God favors to his covenant people are such that as to surpass both their own and others' thoughts and expectations. Who would have said that God should send his son to die for us, his spirit to sanctify us, his angels to attend to us? Who would have said that such great sins should be pardoned? And now Sarah laughs with joy at the incredible move of the Lord in her own life. We must likewise never forget the wonder, the joy, and the surprise of our salvation. In fact, the joy that came at Isaac's birth, as we see in Genesis 21, 6 through 7, it finds its expression again just a few years later once the child is weaned. Now Abraham throws a party when this happens, verse 8 tells us, an event that seems strange to us in the West until we consider the high rate of infant mortality during the patriarch period. Breastfeeding did did not often stop until a child was two or three, and death was an ever-present risk until then. And consequently, Isaac's weaning is cause for celebration. He has survived and will indeed be Abraham's heir. One threat to Isaac's inheritance remains, the presence of his half-brother Ishmael. And so Genesis 21, 9 through 10, it tells us of Sarah's indignant reaction when she found Hagar's son laughing. This is no innocent act on Ishmael's part. The verb used for his laughter in verse 9 has nasty connotations. Let's take Judges 16.24, for example. It uses it to describe the Philistines' moments before they brought Samson out for their own devious pleasure. And therefore, while noting that we cannot be sure of Ishmael's exact behavior, it seems relatively plain that he is mocking Isaac somehow. He is likely making fun of the circumstances of Isaac's birth or pretending to be the favored son. Now, Abraham is displeased at Sarah's demand to cast out the slave woman and her son in Genesis 21, 10 through 11. And though the harshness with which he speaks is probably a bit excessive, Sarah rightly asserts that Ishmael will not be the heir with Isaac. And whether spoken out of maternal jealousy or not, she recalls the promise made to Abraham that Isaac and not anyone else is the successor. Now, this statement, it helps prepare Abraham and the reader for the Lord's affirmation of Sarah's desire to expel Hagar and her son in verses 12 through 13. And yet, still, Abraham and Yahweh must remain sympathetic to the plight of this Egyptian maidservant, as we're going to see tomorrow. And with Hagar and Ishmael sent off to Beersheba, this threat to Abraham's chosen offspring is no more. You see, today God's people continue to face mockery and derision like Isaac did. But the expulsion of Ishmael, it helps us assure that one day the elect will no longer have to endure scorn, ridicule, or any other event. And the removal of Ishmael, it proves that God is continually working to advance his kingdom and to remove threats to his people. Sometimes the advance of his reign requires that he protect us. Other times he may have to, we, we may have to suffer and hope in our final rescue in order that the knowledge of the Lord may increase. Consider the many ways that God may be protecting you while you drive or go about your business. And then thank the Lord for promised eternal safety to his people. Now, Abraham's reluctance to send away his son Ishmael is evident in his anger towards Sarah's demand in verse 11, as well as the need for the Lord to tell him to do as his wife has said. 
And once he has heard from God, Abraham obeys, but he does it half-heartedly. He only gives Hagar bread and a skin of water, hardly enough supply for a desert journey. Many commentators suggest that the patriarch wanted Hagar and Ishmael to remain close by, and so he only provides a meager supply of food and drink so they cannot get very far. Abraham is not the only one concerned for Ishmael and his mother. As we look at today's passage, this chapter, Hagar and her son lost in the wilderness with no water left to drink. We're meant to sympathize with the Egyptian maidservant's plight, her abandonment of the youth under a bush in a retreat to a locale outside the earshot of his cries, emphasize the dire situation in which she is facing in verses 15 through 16. And yet our sympathy is not certainly enough to help this poor mother. Only heavenly intervention can rescue this family. The Lord has a special place in his heart for the afflicted, Psalm 140.12 tells us. And we should not be amazed that he rescues Hagar and her son from starvation as we see in verses 17 through 19 of Genesis 21. His attitude towards Hagar and Ishmael is vastly different than that of Sarah's. And though he endorses Ishmael's removal in order to eliminate the threat from Isaac's inheritance, the Lord does not share Sarah's cruel motivation. And now this explains how the Lord works out his will. God sovereignly ordains that everything happens, including tragedy. Ephesians 1.11 says, But as we're seeing today, he never has some callous heart towards those who are suffering. Ishmael is not the chosen seed, but God remembers the promise given in Genesis 17:20, and works to make him a great nation. And Hagar acts righteously, securing a wife for Ishmael, like Abraham will do for Isaac in Genesis 21, 20 through 21 and 24. And so Ishmael receives gracious benefits, even though he is not one of the Lord's people. And thus, as uh, Matthew Henry remarks, many are full of the blessings of God's promise who are strangers to the blessings of his covenant. John Christendom comments, The grace of God is the greatest security and the most impregnable fortification. And though all outward circumstances might testify otherwise, the Lord's people know that he is their rock and will sustain them uh, through every or situation, through death for an eternal resurrected life. Are you facing a losing battle today? Well, look to God to sustain you and know that whatever storms may come, you'll be safe for eternity in the arms of the Lord. Abimelech, the king of Gerier, appears in our chapter in order to seal a covenant that's going to prove very significant in the Lord's plan of redemption. Isaac's birth progresses Yahweh's promise towards a goal, a holy nation through which the world will be blessed. This covenant with Abimelech in Genesis 21 uh, 22 through 34 is a substantial step forward regarding God's pledge of land in Genesis 15:7 through 21. And seeing that Abraham is blessed by the Lord, the king of Gerior seeks to make a pact with him. And it's not clear how Abimelech knows the one, the true God, with Abraham and all that he does. Most likely he has witnessed the patriarch's general pattern of success, including the miraculous birth of Isaac. In any case, the king is evidently unnerved at Abraham's ascendancy, and so Abimelech seeks to, uh, to know this fortune will continue for the patriarch's children. And he assumes they might even supplant his own kingdom in verses 22 through 23. Now, Abraham agrees to this proposed covenant, but not before scolding Abimelech about his servant's seizure of the patriarch's well. And protesting his innocence, Abimelech receives a tribute of seven female sheep from Abraham, which signals that the patriarch has indeed dug the well and had illegal rights to it in verses 26 to 32. After all this time, Abraham is, uh, finally has physical proof that the Lord is going to give his family the land of Canaan. Access to water was necessary for life in the land, and so the well enables Abraham to set up a permanent residence there, according to verses 33 through 34. His days as a nomad or ever, and in fact, the name of the place, Beersheba, it means the well of an oath, reminding everyone that Abraham's family has a claim to the region. And besides teaching the latter generations of Israel that God gave Canaan into their hands, what this chapter does, it also reminds Moses' original audience that they could make peace with certain inhabitants of the land. As with Rahab in Joshua 2 and Joshua 6, 22-25, Abraham's bond with Abimelech showed the Israelites they were to make those 
uh, peace with those, I should say, who desired to embrace the blessings Yahweh had for the sons of Jacob. New Covenant believers are also called to be peacemakers in Romans 12, 18, in order that they might enter the kingdom of Christ. That, that is to say, Christians are called first and foremost to be peacemakers in the church. Every time we refuse to repent when we sin, we threaten the peace of God's people. And if we continue to bring up the offenses of those whom we claim to have forgiven, we're not making peace with those who de- desire to share in the blessings of the covenant. With whom do you need to make peace today? Be reconciled through forgiveness of or repentance towards that person with whom you're not getting along. I want to thank you for listening or watching the Reading the Bible Daily with Dave podcast. My name is Dave. Today is January 21st, and we've looked at Genesis 21. Until tomorrow, may the Lord richly bless you and keep you. Thank you for listening to today's episode of Reading the Bible Daily with Dave podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe to the show and rate us wherever you listen to podcasts. Be sure to also like, subscribe, or follow Servants of Grace on Facebook, Instagram, X, or YouTube. We appreciate your support.